All righty. It seems like we have folks in the room. Um, good evening. Thank you all for coming and welcome to this Black History Month panel, um, which is we've titled Conceptualizing Black Experiences in Engineering. Um, before we begin, um, as a as a new settler to Canada myself, I think we'd like to um, take a moment to acknowledge that I'm coming to you from Toronto, um, which is the dish with one spoon territory. Um, and we respectfully acknowledge the past and present traditional owners of the land um, and the territory and their unique role in the life of the region. Um, Toronto is on the traditional territory of the Anishkabeg, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is covered by the Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nations. Um, we pay our respects to the elders past, present, and emerging, and as settlers, we are grateful for the opportunity to live, work, and play in this territory. Um, I would also like to ta thank um, my colleague Allison Olichowski of U of T and the Ontario Society of Professional Engineers, and also Spin Master for uh, making the event possible. I'm Philip Asari. I am a faculty member in the Faculty of Applied Science and Engineering at the University of Toronto. Um, I sit in an institute called the Institute for Studies in Transdisciplinary Engineering Education and Practice, and I'm always happy when I get that right, because it's a mouthful, and I also teach in the Division of Engineering Science. Um, I'm particularly interested in the human side of engineering um, and, and all that that entails. Uh, but for today, we'll be having a wonderful panel um, with uh, three other folks here um, who will we'll get a chance to introduce themselves soon around um, the issues of being black in engineering um, and a couple of themes will emerge um, and um, that I think will be good discussion between all of us. Um, I also do want to note that it was, you know, underrepresentation in engineering became an issue just putting the panel together and finding folks to, to be on the panel. And so um, there's definitely a need to, to have this conversation and, uh, and uh, to, to move the needle and have a cultural shift in in the way that we approach engineering as it relates to um, Black experiences. Um, so without much further ado, I'd like to um, have the panelists introduce themselves. And so we'll go in the order of Suzanne and then Nick and then Chris. Good evening, everyone. Um, thanks for joining. My name is Suzanne. I am an innovation specialist at I don't know if I'm supposed to say the company name, but a mining company. Uh, my experience spans from uh, research and engineering to biomedical applications to a little bit, a little bit more of human factors. Uh, so now I, I work primarily in tech, uh, looking at how we innovate in the engineering space within mining specifically. Hi everyone, I'm really excited to be part of this panel. Um, my name is Nicholas. I'm a fifth year biochemical engineer studying at Queen's University. So I'm in my last year. I took a year off to work at Sanofi Pasteur, which is a vaccine production company. Um, and for my final year, I've been kind of in a lot of discussions relating to marginalized voices on Queen's campus, uh, especially with the creation of the Instagram accounts that were documenting experiences of discrimination, and systemic racism within the Smith School of Business. And I ended up starting the Instagram account for the engineering faculty. Good afternoon and good evening to everyone. Thank you for joining. My name is Chris Elliott and I am a project manager for design at Spin Master, um, which for those of you who don't know is a toy company. Work closely with our engineering and product development stakeholders to make sure that we're hitting all of our major milestones in a timely manner um, and to Phillips point earlier about underrepresentation in engineering. It's a, kind of one of the reasons why I'm here. Um, unfortunately, Spin Master is, falls in that category. And um, fortunately, I get to lend a voice though for that underrepresented uh, minority in engineering. So I'm glad to be here and a part of the conversation. 
Great. Thank you all for the introduction. Uh, before we get into the, the discussion, um, just a reminder that if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat um, and hold questions for the Q&A um, session. And if you have a question that is directed at a particular panelist, uh, be sure to indicate that so uh, we can move that way. So um, this, this panel is going to be less of a traditional Q&A panel um, in that we're we're going to start the conversation and see where it goes. <laughs> um, and as moderator, I'll be trying to move things along and, and get us to cover as many topics as, as possible. Uh, but, but one of the things I wanted to start with is um, sort of the notion of, of fear. I think coming into this panel, prior discussions we talked a lot about, let's make it open and honest conversation. Um, and it's interesting that we say that because it's sort of, well, why can't we have an open and honest conversation about these issues, right? So what, what, what's wrong with doing that? And I think um, for me specifically, I find myself in spaces where I, I'm often thinking about what do I want to say and does it make sense to say it in this particular context, right? Because there could be blowback and, um, you know, you don't, you're always kind of wondering about, do you want to draw attention to yourself? Do you even want to accept the invitation to come to a panel that is asking you to do uh, something open and honest? Um, so I just wanted to throw that thought out there and see what the, the panelists uh, have to say from their perspective around that. And even any one of you can jump in. Well, I want to say that I'm very grateful that you opened up with with fear being the, the topic, because um, I think once we've addressed that, maybe I personally will feel a little bit a little bit more relaxed to be a little bit more uh, open and honest about my experiences moving forward. But I marinated on that too uh, since our last discussion is why I'm afraid to be honest about my own life experiences and why I fear consequence um, of that honesty. Um, right. I, um, part of it was I don't know who's watching, you know, and, and I don't know how that inf the, it, any information I share about my life experiences can be um, used against me in a way. And is that fair? Right. I think like coming from the perspective of a student going to like a predominantly white school, I think like since studying there since 2016 and not having these discussions about what it's like to be black in engineering, this idea of fear has come from like not wanting to further like alienate yourself as a student, especially as a, a black student in like a predominantly white space. And I think like as a black student, this whole mindset has been like, just focus on your studies and like you'll get through this degree and you'll get through the hard work. But then in a turn, it kind of makes, you then have to kind of forget that you're a black student and you also go through these systemic problems of like oppression and racism that also contribute to like how you experience the world and how you experience life on campus. Um, and I think that's why like that, like I started the Instagram account because just that idea of like, I wanted to, like I knew that these things were happening on campus, but like no one was talking about it. And, I, and like, I saw that courage coming out from Smith School of Business of creating the Instagram account. So I knew if like voices came together, we could finally show like our faculty that we didn't need like another report or like task force, but like action needed to be taken. As you guys were talking, like so many things were just going through my brain. One of them just even being, uh, as I introduced myself, questioning whether or not I should mention the company I work for, right? And these are little things that sometimes you even, you don't think about, but in a sense, it's you kind of checking yourself without realizing, which, I think is a little bit, I don't know, it's dangerous and it, it's become so ingrained in us. I feel that even when it's not normal, we just feel like it's normal. Um, but I think in terms of also just realizing, and I shared this example before, but having that sense of community, the company I work for now, I, I mean, it's, I joined remotely, so it's a different experience, but the few people that I have met who are black, there's probably 10 of us and some of them have been there for 20 plus years and they knew all the other black people. Um, but it's just so interesting that when we are in that environment as a black person, 
the community, the sense of community just feels different and how you pinpoint it is just, you can't even explain it, but there's just this feeling of, I feel free, I feel liberated. So to Chris's point, it's like, why can't I feel this way around other environments? What is it about? And to me, that's the systemic part, right? It's what is it about the other environments that makes me feel that, you know, I'm just less comfortable in a way that I can't even pinpoint. Yeah, and I was, as you're speaking, Suzanne, I was thinking about the way that the fear manifests itself in the way I navigate spaces, right? Like I'm, when I walk into, well, now I'm, I'm, I'm in a much more comfortable place. I'm, I'm biracial for anyone who doesn't know or can't tell. Um, and so being biracial, I grew up kind of in this, this, this liminal space, this limbo of not being black enough for my black community, but being something too other for the white community. And so I grew up with a little bit of resentment towards my black community. But as I've, I've grown and educated myself, I've realized that their preferences or their, their inability to want to um, accept me is not based on their own inclinations. It's based on a systemic issue, right? Like we prefer light skin, why? Not because we do, but because it's always been more um, beneficial to be lighter in past. Um, nonetheless, I because I feel othered or less than or afraid uh, in spaces, I'm, I, I'm not able to be my full authentic self. So I might not show up 100% at work all the time, or I might not show up 100% as a student all the time. And then when you compound that with things that are going on in, in our current day of age, right, we've got Georgia trying to pass all these laws to, to suppress voter rights, you know, we, there's so much stuff going on uh, in, in the real world. And um, I think a lot of that gets forgotten when you walk into a, a classroom or into a corporate space, right? Like you're supposed to put your humanity to the side or your black humanity to the side to produce a product that, what? Yeah, to, to add up to that, just like the whole idea of like leaving your blackness at the door is like something I really resonate with because that's how like when I, I shared my story on like the Instagram account like the first story I shared was like how I had felt kind of like this idea of racelessness where like I had to kind of forget that I was a black student and instead of being like a black engineering student I was just only an engineering student and that idea of like my blackness not being important in my degree was something really almost like debilitating for like my mental health when I was like looking back on my year, like first second and third years like I truly was not like in touch with like my black culture. And it was also like, because of that lack of like sense of community, like what Suzanne was bringing up, like Queens, we just had, we just got like a NSBE, a National Society of Black Engineering chapter like this year. And it was started by like, basically the school bringing together the black engineering students for like a shutdown STEM event. And we were like, oh, there's more than 10 of us in this faculty. We did not know that. And we, just started an Ernesby chapter when like looking at U of T who's had theirs for like I don't know I think it's one of the oldest in the Canada at least but that like it's kind of shocking to me like how we've had such a lack of sense of community at Queens because like we didn't know how many black engineers there were honestly. And also just to add on what Chris was saying around you know other events happening outside to some point, you just have to also pick your battles. So, you know, if I have to be a citizen and fight all these other things, like, do I want to go to the office and fight all these other things? Um, and I think it's something most people don't realize. I was part of a, um, a Black ERG, Enterprise Resource Group. And it's just, I mean, you do all this because you care. You do all this because it affects you. But ultimately, you do all this on top of your job, right? And when you're trying to get allies pulled in, it's almost like a nice to have. It was just so difficult to get people with influence to pay attention until George Floyd, which I thought was interesting. So it's almost like it always needs something bigger and big enough to notice the little things that, like I was partially annoyed, if I can be very honest and candid, because it's little things we've been saying over and over and over. And it's like, yeah, 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 yeah. And nobody showed up. And all of a sudden, within a month, we could have calls with the CEO just like that. So it's also, to, to me, again, going back to the systemic thing, it's things like that where even if you say, I'm not racist, it's have you been paying attention when all these other smaller things were brought forward to you? Or did you have to wait for something to be big enough 
to react. Right, but would you even dare ask somebody that question? Or would you, I don't know, for me, I'd be way too afraid. Yeah, see, exactly. I wouldn't. I mean, exactly. <laughs> I wouldn't. We're constantly having to filter ourselves, right? And that, that dual consciousness is so, um, it's just not healthy. It's not healthy. To be in a space, to be home in a community where you're surrounded by like minds and like like people, right? Like you can be one way, but then you've got to go out into the world and, and embody a completely different character. Like you said, Nick, you have to check your blackness at the door. I don't speak the same way at home as I do at the office. I mean, of course, I'm not going to drop F-bombs here at the office and like that, but nonetheless, like I'm not as, as casual. I'm not as, I'm not as comfortable. I have to, I have to act like Becky with the good hair because I, I, to some, I am Becky with the good hair. But that's how I've been able to, to, to move along in corporate America and all the different industries that I've worked in. Not by, not by, not by highlighting and emphasizing the uniqueness that is me, but by hiding it. And I feel that even sometimes when you do try to say it, it's almost like you're, it's, it's not that important or you're, you're dramatizing the scenario. And I'll try to tell that story in a very short form. But when I was doing my master's, um, we had someone from industry come and they were basically, it was kind of like an expo where everyone had their projects and they would come around and try and match you with different jobs and opportunities. And I noticed that she would just never come to my table. And I was the only black student. So it's again, you know, there's the filtering, there's the, I want to believe in the best of people, but I was just, why is it my table? Like every other person got a stop by their table. Um, and at some point, one person specifically came, looked at my poster and said, oh, I want to talk to this person. So I got up and went behind my table and she looked and I was like literally right there. She looked right through me and said, oh no, this person's not here. Let's go over there. And I tried to tell this to fellow students that I felt comfortable with. I was like, I feel like she's a little bit racist, but like, you don't, you never know. Maybe she just doesn't like me. Maybe she doesn't like my project, whatever it is. But it had, it took someone else seeing that to, to have other people now validate that, oh yeah, maybe she's racist. And it's, it's, it's frustrating, right? Because it's, hey, <laughs> why doesn't my voice count when I say something that affects me directly, but it almost has to be validated, checked, approved by someone different for it to be valuable. Um, yeah. And that is dangerous because then you stop trusting your own gut. You stop trusting your, that is such a gas lit experience. You know, you, you are walking through life, living your own experiences, but you're second guessing the reality of it all the way through. Maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm the only one who saw it until it gets externally validated by someone or something else. And that is so unhealthy and toxic. And it doesn't make for a productive employee or coworker or family member or citizen, you know? Yeah, which... This is, I, th I think this, this conversation is moving into, into another issue, which is interesting, right? Um, I think, Chris, the last point that you made about sort of productive employee, whatever. I mean, all these environments, right, universities, companies, whatever, claim they care about their employees and their well-being, right? And, the, you know, we're here for you and how can we best support you and and we, we, we care about productive employees, but it's just kind of like what they say and what they do are kind of two different things, right? Um, so, you know, I, I've run into situations where I, I kind of have to remind people, again, because it's just kind of like, oh, this, this is not a problem, right? So, so I run into a situation, uh, you know, sometimes where, I, you know, my classrooms are a bit more democratic right and students students do push back and and so when i'm like yeah then and we've had, i've had to make decisions that weren't necessarily just me right so the department had to get involved in order to resolve some some issues in the classroom but you know a lot of faculty are like you're the professor just just kind of use your authority and move on and i'm just kind of like it doesn't work that way for me <laughs> right and and if i do that 
I'm actually creating a worse situation because I said I wasn't going to do that at the beginning of class, right? So I need to be able to work with these students as adults. And it's not just kind of, I'm the professor and move on. And I'm like, you're, you're creating a situation by doing that where the students get to question my competence, right? Which, which is not, which is not the situation that I want to, I want to get into. Um, but, but it, it's funny for me because it's like, I have to tell you this, <laughs> right? And it's kind of like, how, how do you not recognize that this is what's going on? And I, it's, it's always kind of people make suggestions and you have to kind of remind them that, yo, this, this suggestion is creating a much worse situation than you think it, it's solving. Um, so I, I, I kind of wanted to put that out there and see um, what, what thoughts you all have about this sort of what places say they're interested in with respect to, you know, equity, diversity, and inclusion, and what they actually do. Are we all going to sit on mute on this one? <laughs> this is this why you I mean, started with a pure question? Right, <laughs> like, exactly. Here on the air. <laughs> I thought I we like got fear out of the a, way. This so. is a common experience through over the 400, 500 years, you know, up until now, right? Um, of, of, of institutions saying they're going to do something and then what they say completely conflicts with what they actually end up doing. And I think that, 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 I think that there's, a, there's a discomfort to have these kinds of conversations. Um, I'm going to be specific. I, I think that white fragility is a real thing. I think it's hard for white people to sit down and hear these conversations without feeling overwhelmed by shame or guilt or helplessness or hopelessness or anger or rage. Um, it, it's hard to have constructive conversations about racism because people get, it's, it's, I don't think we're equipped and I'll speak for America because that's where I'm in Los Angeles, but um, I don't think we're equipped to have these emotional conversations. We get too wrapped up in the feelings to really move the conversation forward. At least that's what I've experienced firsthand in some conversations that I've had at work. Um, we can't we can't move to resolution because we get too stuck in the feeling. But I think if we can we can move past that, then we can eventually have a safe space for conversations like these. Um, but to me, that's the first step: is just providing safe spaces for these conversations so that people of color can voice their experiences and their needs, um, and then and then we can be met there. But I am waiting. And I think to add to what you said, it's also not just the equipment, but do we even have, so first of all, going back to the fear, if you're the only person who's going to represent a different opinion in terms of how things should be done, who should be hired, how diversity is not working, um, it almost feels like if you're going the democratic route, it's one vote. And the reality is most places are, are not, aren't diverse. So how do you even take that opinion that even though it's a single person opinion, but is really the voice of, I guess, the future diversity path we should be going towards? I think that's another big question that is yet to be explored properly, in my opinion. Yeah. And how do we do all that without applying undue pressure and, and uh, unfair weight on people of color to push it forward, right? Like we need our allies to sit down and, and, and implement these changes because like they're, they're at the top, right? Um, and that all trickles down. Yeah. But like, it's not, it's not my responsibility as a brown person to teach a white person about white privilege. There's a lot of books out there. When all this stuff went down in June, I had some, I had some cope. Some people re reach out to me, some white people reach out to me and ask, what can I do? I literally went on Google and typed, what can white people do? And there was a slew of answers. And I just shot that link out to all of them. It was like, if I can Google it, so can you, you know, it's not on me. It's not my responsibility to teach you about the system that you created and perpetuate without you, without you consciously knowing, you know? Yeah, that's like a really important, I like whole subject and topic because like that whole idea of like BIPOC students specifically having to do this work to like basically lift themselves out of oppression is like basically what's been happening on Queens campus. Like, cause like on Queens, like we've had multiple reports basically done by professors and students and like task force saying like, yeah, Queens campus is racist. Like on multiple years, we've just had people doing research to be like, just to validate that, like students have been saying 
we feel discriminated here and like here's a report to sh show that it's happening and then like no real like steps are taken to like solve that or like actionable items where like students can actually feel safe on campus and usually it's like BIPOC students who have to like create clubs or create these events or like create positive spaces for their own communities just to feel like validated and stay safe on their campus and like again like it took like Instagram accounts where BIPOC students or QT BIPOC students were again sharing like experiences of trauma for our school to want to finally have these conversations because like before these Instagram accounts like I was never talking to my dean or I was never being invited to have conversations with my dean on like a bi-weekly basis like my dean didn't know who I was or didn't even know how many black students he probably had in his engineering faculty but because of like the resurgence of like the Black Lives Matter um, like the black, resurgence of the Black Lives Matter like group because of George Floyd's death and again people saying like you need to start taking action and then institutions being like oh damn if we don't take action then we're gonna get called out or canceled it was like that whole idea of like okay we have to do something because everyone is saying we have to do something now yeah it almost feels like there has to be a huge financial um impact for anybody to make mm. any kind of change mm -hmm. you know or something to that effect right yeah. like yeah. And I mean, how long have, have Black lives been intrinsic, intrinsically interwoven with finances? I'd say we're still on the action block. Mm -hmm. So, I'm gonna so add that two raises... I was just waiting to see if anyone wanted to add something. Uh, but when Chris mentioned earlier as well, just Google it. To me, it also has to do with a sense of curiosity, right? It's it's not just about just waiting for the answers to come slap you in the face or get the exact right answer. But to me, it's a learning curve. You're going to be wrong on the way. And it's okay as long as you're actually trying to learn. But if you're trying to get that perfect, you know, book that's going to tell you all the great things, there are nuances in the Black community. Not everyone's going to react the same thing, the same way to different things, and I think that's also an important aspect of, um, of all this conversation. Yeah, it's 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 it's, it's taken a, a long time to get here to this to this point that we're at in in the world, and what I find is that we work and live in so many different types of systems economic systems, social systems, corporate systems. And we don't stop to think about how and why they function the way they function. And so we're just stuck on this hamster wheel of systemic everything. Um, and, and we have an opportunity now to hand out the red pill to everyone and have them wake up from the matrix. <laughs> and I, I'm hoping that's what people do when they walk into work, ask themselves, wait, but why do I get paid X amount more than so certain kinds of people? Or why do certain kinds of people have to provide two forms of identification to vote? Or just just why, uh, why, why do I feel comforted by police, but these other people feel threatened by them? Like just simple, basic, things you know we have to really stop and and look at how we got here in order to undo it right but that's that requires us to sit down and have like i said have that open and honest and uncomfortable conversation and it requires people to like to just do things differently and that's hard i i used to be an alcoholic i got sober do you know how hard that was i there was a day when i thought that i would die before my life changed and that I would die just like my father did. Fortunately, he passed away and that gave enough um, impetus for me to wanna change my life, but I know it's possible. I know it's possible and it was incredibly uncomfortable and it was probably the most painful thing I've ever done, but if not for that, then I wouldn't be here today. And that's what we have to do on every single level of, of, of socioeconomic conversation. We have, to, we have to stop and talk about how we got here and why we're here and what we can undo or what we can redo to, to move forward in a more inclusive way. Like I am a more on point visual representation of what the world looks like as far as skin tone is concerned, right? Like we're not so black, literally black and white anymore. The black experience is a nuanced one just because I don't have an Afro hair, wide nose, big hips, which I wish I did have, doesn't mean that I'm not black enough. You know what I mean? Like. Ugh. I want to move that thread towards engineering. 
which is why we're here <laughs> a, a little bit. Um, you know, the, the thing the thing that was going through my mind as you were talking, Chris and others, about just sort of the conversations that that we need to have. Um, and I'm going to say this because I guess this, this is the kind of open and honesty that maybe uh, they were looking for. I think engineering needs to get over itself. Um, honestly, um, I think uh, engineering and the STEM fields have kind of put themselves on this pedestal of kind of we're the best thing that ever happened to the world. Um, and it can only be done a certain way. Um, and often that way means people like me don't get to, you know, kind of participate or my, my culture or view is not welcome because it's not professional enough or whatever it is, whatever other kind of, you know, title or concept they want to attach to um, excluding me. And, and, and it's a little frustrating because again, you know, engineering does this dual thing of, you know, engineering is this mechanism that's going to save the world, drive, you know, economic progress, innovate, help people. Right. And then you go to an engineering program and what happens is like math, 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 physics, 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 some thermodynamic thing that you can't really kind of wrap your head around and how this is all helping people. You do that for about four years and it's like, here, go to industry um do something and maybe depending on where you go that that continues to happen because you're sitting down writing equations and looking at spreadsheets and you're just kind of like where are the people right <laughs> um and where are the people like me and how is this really helping because that's what i got into it for um and for me particularly you become faculty and it's like why don't we talk about this more and everybody's like but that's not what engineering is about i'm like but that's not what we say in the marketing materials when we're trying to get people to come to the program and pay all this money right um and so, um, yeah, I think for me, it's just kind of like part of that is we need to have that conversation on sort of how is engineering kind of played a role in this and propagating that and, and the culture that we've created in engineering. Um, and we need to get over it because because doing the way it's always been done isn't going to change anything. I don't think we can get um, to to where we want to be in terms of inclusion by just keeping all those things that have some of uh, all of that racist mindset ingrained um, and just kind of, you know, keeping the status quo and hoping that we can fit all these things on as, as added. Um, but that's my perspective. I want to know what you all want to say about that. I mean, yeah, that's pretty much on the nose for how I felt when I was coming back from my last year is like, I just felt like engineer or like my degree was like so dated in the fact that like I was learning about like chemical reactions and thermodynamics, but I wasn't understanding like how I was going to go out into the world and start engineering the world when like I wasn't really learning about the world around me. And like obviously as a black student, like I understand what my experience is as like a black person and I am like in tune with like the fact that not everyone experiences the world like um of some white cis male but a lot of people who i go to school with like who are predominantly white cis male do not understand how the world works and are not learning to be like culturally competent engineers and i think that's what's missing is like this idea of understanding like how do we have like social justice dialogues within like the context of engineering and how do we bring that into the classroom and it's something that like professors have not really shown interest in like until like now that we've been having these discussions on wanting to increase equity, diversity, inclusivity in engineering. Um, like in one class for my stats class, we started learning about like how AI has like racial bias. And like, that was a nice way to bring that discussion of understanding that like, if you're gonna use a data set, you have to make sure that you're understanding that the world is not just white males. And like, there are different shades and different tones and different faces and different sizes that you have to consider and be cognizant of. And it's just having bringing those small discussions in that can like kind of help connect engineering with the world, I think. I agree. And I feel like that's a little bit of like the search I've done to end up where I ended up in engineering. And I can relate to that example around AI where it's just the the co-ops we got were focused on the technical, right? And I was kind of the person nudging them, hey, like. Did your data set take that into the consideration? Like who's gonna be using this? Um, but these are not, I feel like it's almost critical thinking, but not on a human lens. Like we do a lot of critical thinking in terms of safety, making things sure things don't fail. Uh, but I find that the human component of 
you know, whatever it is we design is just not even taught. And speaking to my educational experience, I guess, I remember having probably two electives. <laughs> One was um, like history and the other, I don't remember, but it it's almost to say that it doesn't, it doesn't promote forming well-rounded individuals. It really re just promotes be good at, you know, the hard stuff. And if you're really good at the hard stuff, when, when it comes time to become, you know, the soft skill type of, you know, paying attention to people's needs, paying attention to the consequences of what you're putting out there, then it's almost kind of just brushed off. And I know I had a lot of challenges having those conversations because when you bring it up, it's like, yeah, 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 but like this, the technical plan works. And it's, it's just a constant battle of, is this valued enough? Um, like I know in the PNG exam, they make you do ethics, but I feel like the ethical part still didn't really touch to the human experience. It was more ethics as a big umbrella, right? So I, I do think there are lots of changes to be made, not just at the educational level, but even the professional level. Do we have other things we want to bring up that I haven't <laughs> put out there before we, it seems like we're, we're starting to segue into like, what can people do? I mean, I think we've been making some actual recommendations about what are some of the things that need to change, maybe not necessarily how <laughs> to get there, but are there other points or topics that we, any of you feel are important for the folks that are currently in the room to hear? before we, we switch to that. And Nick, I know you have to go in about seven minutes or so, but. No, maybe just sharing cool. something. Um, so my faculty invited me a few months ago um, and specifically for that. So to talk about social equality and how it ties to engineering and it was for freshman students. And it was interesting because I had a really hard time trying to like map how would engineering work? Like I had examples, but when I really reflected back on my experience, it was like, you have to dig really deep to try and find that connection. Um, yeah, that's just the other thing I wanted to add. Cool. So I'm guessing the question on most people's minds is where do we go from here? <laughs> where do we start? Um, to begin to kind of address this in, in some meaningful way. And, any ideas from the panelists? Well, the one thing I would say is that even though this panel is focused on engineering, so more of the professional lens, I think we're human before anything. So the way you are going to react in terms of diversity, anti-racism and all of that, within your work environment should reflect in your personal space, right? If, if you're gonna be respectful to this black person at the office, do you even have black friends? Like, do you interact with black people on a regular enough basis or is it just your work, you know, person that you have to interact with? Cause it is a part of society, we're a blended society. So my one piece of feedback is just like, pay attention in all the spaces you're at, whether it's home, your kids, um camps i don't know what people do but <laughs> in all those environments just check yourself and and see if it's something you're doing because you're forced to be doing it because you're forced to be exposed or if it's something you're constantly kind of just paying attention to because i think that's important i think like when it comes to taking action like like from a student lens I think it's really important that like our institutions listen to the communities that they want to actually help. Like again, we've had that this we've kind of brought up that like usually it's BIPOC employees or students doing that work, but like white allies can be actively doing the work and coming up with action items and things that they want to be implementing to ensure that they're creating like an equity equitable space, but it's always important that like you bring in the people that you want to help and ha like include them in the conversation so like an example is like my faculty wanted to create like this blog space where they would be sharing student voices like marginalized voices and like their experiences in engineering and they asked me to be a part of that project and i was like like what's the real goal of this space though it's like if it's again to have students basically educate again white students about 
the trauma that they've experienced in engineering, then there's real, there's no real action happening. Like if you want to support marginalized students, you should probably just give them money so they, they can attend your institution or like put money into like how you want to help them, like put money into creating spaces for them to come together and create a community for themselves or like put money behind clubs that are actually doing work to create these spaces already. Cause like there's already work being done on like Queens campus by BIPOC students. It's just like, we need more support, like monetary support. Yeah, I'd, 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 I'd second that Nick and, and, and also follow that up with, um, I think asking people how they need to be supported like in their own specific way, like instead of assuming, right? Like, let me assume this is what you need and here you go. Can we ask? How can I help you? How can I better support you? What do you need? How are you feeling? You know, and to, to, to Suzanne's point, at the end of the day, we're all human beings, right? We are a global community, no matter what nation you may claim or the color of your skin or the religion you practice, we are all human beings at the end of the day and we're all living a very human experience. We all have feelings, you know, and, and, and that is what drives our behavior. That is the way that we, that's what drives who we are at work. That is who, what drives who we are at home with our children and our families is how we feel. Um, and, and so I, I really, I want to put a lot of emphasis on that creating safe places to have these open and honest conversations and to, and to, and to make mistakes. Like you said, Suzanne earlier, like you might ask a question that's going to offend somebody, but it's better you ask the, uh, ask the question and learn the right way to respond than walk around assuming the whole time. Right? Like, yeah. So I'd like to follow up on something you said, Chris, about the, the asking, you know, how, how, folks can be supported. I would say on top of that, then be willing to act on what they ask for, no questions asked, right? <laughs> if you're going to ask how I want to be supported, I, I want to know that you're going to do or at least seriously consider what I say and not come back with some excuse as to why that that can't happen because I don't know. Um, I think that that's important. This is one nit nitpicky thing about the conversation, even just thinking about the influence that the engineering culture has this whole kind of hard versus soft skill thing um we need to stop what we call the soft skills are what i i call the essential skills if you can't deal with other human beings i don't know what you're doing in engineering i mean just your co-workers never mind let's say the client or society if you can't work with the other people around you i mean they're not soft at all. They are essential. They're actually the more difficult skill to, to, to pick up and do well. Um, you know, the computer software has been taking over a lot of the detailed technical stuff that we do anyway. So that, that part can be automated. That, that, that means that part's easy. Um, the part you can't automate is that human interaction. Right. Um, and that's and so, so discriminatory and dismissive to people who might not necessarily have the financial opportunity to go to university universities and acquire those hard skills. Right. But are super yeah, adept yeah. with those soft skills because they've they've grown up and they've acquired this just by just by living. Yeah. Right. And hustling on the street. So that language needs to be uh, needs to be updated. Right. And I like your use of essential versus soft. Yeah, I think, yeah, the language is important. The way we talk about things is going to. Um, be critical going forward. I do like, you know, a lot of the points that we raised about, we just, we need to have conversation and people need to be okay with getting it wrong. I mean, we don't have all the answers, but I think uh, like Suzanne said, it's the willingness to continue to work on things. And thank you, Nick, um, running off the class um, is, is what's most important, right? Like I, I, you know, I don't mind that there are issues, but it, it's the willingness to continue to work on addressing those issues and moving in a positive direction that that's most important. Um, so I think uh, what we can do is kind of open it up a little bit for Q&A, because I feel like some of the questions and comments from the audience will help drive this conversation further. We've had some time to kind of sit on our soapbox and <laughs> say what we think. Um, so I think at this point, we'll get to the, the Q&A. And I, I believe we're using the chat for the Q&A. OSPI folks, please help me out. <laughs> I need support. <laughs> no problem, Philip. So um, we are taking questions through the chat feature. Uh, so please write your questions. If your question is directed at a specific panelist, just write the name of the panelist before the question so that um, Philip knows who to ask the question to. 
Uh, but yeah, just opening it up, go ahead. It's too long to type. Vanessa, go ahead and unmute your mic and you can go ahead and ask your question. Thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to say, first of all, all of this was just so powerful. So thank you so, so much for using your voices and sharing all this with us. I just, you know, I'm, I'm very, I've been very involved in the diversity space for a long time in the diversity and engineering space. And I have never one time ever seen panelists and, and within the context of, you know, it's always women in engineering or at best some sort of intersection in engineering, but I've never seen a group of panelists state so openly and candid, candidly about their fear and discomfort in even just talking about this. And I think that that is so powerful and goes to show just how big of a problem we're really facing here right now. So I'm curious what you think, you know, um, Nick was mentioning Nesby before, like the National Society of Black Engineers has existed at McMaster for, for a while. Um, what do you think that young students and these future black engineers or, or, or folks in the, in the field, like what do you think can help them feel safer in sharing their voices and, and, and in general in workplaces, in school, whatever it is? And how can allies help <laughs> if there are suggestions? Fix the whole world first. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm like, okay, let me let me think about that question. How can how can they feel safer to speak up? Mm -hmm. Really, Vanessa? I don't know. I'm still trying to feel safe enough to speak up. Yeah. I'm sweating underneath this blazer. Um, <laughs> I got. I, I feel like they might have a little bit more courage than I because their prefrontal cortexes are still developing, and so they're not thinking things all the way through and a lot more impulsive. Whereas right. I got bills to pay and you know debt to get out of. So I don't know how to embolden the youth any more than they. I think it's just to keep encouraging them when they speak mm -hmm. their truth to just give them the pat on the back. And I guess I can speak from my own experience when I'm afraid to speak up, but I do. Uh, and it's received safely. So I'm not judged or condemned or rejected as a result of what I've shared. That is what has encouraged me to continue speaking my truth. And I think that this is something that we need to do just globally for each other as human beings, learn how to hold space for each other. Um, and maybe hopefully one day that can trickle down into how we have race relation conversations. Um, but yeah, I think at any time anyone shares a truth, if we can accept them or appreciate them or applaud them for it, it will just inherently encourage them to continue down that path. Right. No, that's, that's definitely helpful. And I feel like as allies, we can share our own truths about whatever our, our own vulnerable truths are, mm -hmm. if, even if they're not the same to help make space. But thank you so much for all this, seriously. Philip, did you want me to read out the next question? Um, yeah, sure. I'm seeing comments. I'm not sure if I'm seeing things that are questions. There, okay. There is a yeah. question, yeah, from Ben Hendry. Did you want to take that one? Um, yeah, so I think Ben's asking, they have a PEAK program. Not sure what PEAK stands for, but it, um, it's training. Um, it isn't mandatory. Um, would it help if it was mandatory and included some kind of diversity training? Um, Ben, do you want to explain what PEAK is? Am I supposed to know what PEAK is? Oh, it's the, it's the PEO Education Program in Engineering. Okay, okay, so sort of continuing education. Um, Suzanne, if you want to <laughs> start <laughs> that and I, maybe I'll jump in. Sure, I mean, it doesn't hurt, but I find that the diversity trainings also need to have a certain level of, ooh, I need to plug myself, of understanding, I'll hopefully not get kicked out before I finish speaking, but understanding and connecting with the Black community in this particular example, right? Because otherwise it's just a thing you read and you move on and you forget about it. So I think it would be helpful, the format of it, I just don't know if online training, offline, like watching a recording is going to be as impactful. Anything I think is better than nothing for sure. Um, but I do think that there should be more of a in-person, you know, thinking about it, questioning it uh, component to that exercise or that training. Yeah. 
Yeah, I guess following up from there, I, I have some mixed feelings about trainings, <laughs> um, but and especially mandatory trainings. I think um, you want people to be engaged with things that they see value in, in, in a way. Um, and, you know, having someone go through a training on, on a topic that they're not quite sold on, um, I, I don't know how, how much of an effect it has, right? It's just kind of checking the box. So I did the diversity training and nothing changed, right? So, I mean, if if we're thinking about change, I think that training has to come with some kind of cultural change, possibly at the top in, in some way. I think I think a lot of these things we're talking about, and this often happens, right? So so companies will put out something like diversity training and the CEO never does it, right? Um, but everyone else does. And and I would like to see it some of those things modeled at the top. So no one has an excuse, right? So if you're a CEO of a company and you say you're interested or, you know, president of a university, dean of a college, or that you're really interested in EDI, I want to see you living that. Right. I want to see you valuing that in a way where none of your direct reports have any excuse to do otherwise. Right. But if if you're copping out, then you're giving other people excuses to cop out. Right. Um, and also the resources that you throw at it. Right. Um, I think people were talking in the chat about funding um, for things like NSB chapters and whatever. Um, at, I'm at a university. We have a million and one you know, internal funds for this research and that research and this new innovation in this space and very little for things like EDI. And that kind of says, you know, what we actually value if we're talking about the finances piece of it. Um, I heard a lady, Melissa Harris-Perry, I believe is her name, speak and talk about your budget is your moral document, right? It tells us what you care about. Um, and so a lot of these EDI things often end up being a volunteer thing, right? We don't get any extra compensation for it, but for other kinds of things related to the company, there will be, right? There are other kind of financial incentives for that, right? We all get asked to do panels and all sorts of EDI things, which other people would get paid consulting money to do if it was on a totally different topic, right? Um, as subject matter expert. Um, and so this kind of we're all doing this out of the goodness of our heart thing at some point needs to stop, right? We either pay serious attention to it or 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 not get serious about it. So I'm okay with trainings if they're actually having an effect, but I feel like they do have to have an effect and they have to be compelling and, and be moving the needle in some way or else you know, we're just kind of wasting everybody's time and, and giving ourselves the excuse to say, yeah, we did the training, right, and keep the status quo. But that that's my perspective on it. Um, and now I'm not sure if I've missed other questions in the chat while I was talking. So, Andrea, if you want to point to yeah, <laughs> things no, that no came problem. in. No problem at all. So we've got uh, Maddie who asked, related to that, how can we make Black students comfortable in engineering classrooms, comfortable enough to engage actively in their classrooms? I feel like this one's directed as me as a professor. <laughs> um, it's one of those I don't know questions, right? And I think it's one of those allyship questions. The, the, the professor does set the tone for the, the course environment and then how you even introduce the course and what you say about what's important. Again, how you live out the course um, is going to be critical. And I think we've talked about sort of engineering culture and the way um, certain experiences and the humanness of it get dismissed in courses and, uh, you know, in, in favor of just the topic at hand, right, as that being the most important thing to to address. Uh, I, I really don't know completely how we move away from that. I mean, I have a couple of ideas, but that's just me. One is to bring back the, the humanity in the courses and that the concepts themselves are developed by people and they might be racist, right? You never know. I mean, the Linux Foundation just put out a set of words that we should not use anymore. <laughs> um, and just acknowledging that these words are problematic um, and someone will say, but they're just words. But I mean, they come from somewhere and have certain connotations that are offensive, right? So even things like that and highlighting the, the, the human process that the development of engineering ideas is and how um, racism and oppression can sneak into that um, is is important. I read the book um, Engineering Justice and, and they talk about, you know, whose beams are you analyzing, right? So even the examples that you pick 
to talk about, but you know, folks talk about bias in AI. Um, tell a story of of what's important, right? And and um, and yeah, what is privilege in engineering, right? So if you're using sort of esoteric, um, mostly cool for a white cisgendered population kind of examples in class, that's what you're telling your class engineering is and is important. Um, and those who are not familiar with that are not gonna you know, engage or don't have any, any relation to it and feel checked out and feel left out. I mean, I, I, I'm an immigrant. I had a, that experience coming to university in North America and all the examples were about things that were culturally U S I know nothing about how am I supposed to relate? How am I supposed to work through that example with any, um, reference, right. For, for what's going on. And, and no attempt to kind of bring that, oh, and how did, how might this play out in your particular context or background um, perspective? Where do you see the connection to your lived experience? Um, I think at the very least, if professors invited that, like how do you see this relating to your lived experience or not, or can we find ways to bring that to the classroom? Um, I think students would 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 feel that their their background and perspective is valued that way, but, but those are just initial thoughts. Suzanne, you can add to what you said as well. I'm just thinking, I mean, I don't know the full how profs are checked and all that, but I do know a lot of them are focused on research. And fundamentally, like professors and teachers have such a huge influence on, you know, the next steps in somebody's career. I know so many people who finished because they had to finish, but man, they had such an awful traumatizing experience that they never want to see this again, right? And to your point, is there anything done to make sure that these people who are, I look at them as leaders, right? Like if you're teaching a class, you're leading a group of individuals to learn a certain thing, which is not very different from an organization with a CEO being pro or con a certain you know, diversity element. So is there an element of that in how professors are evaluated? Because back in my days, it was, you know, are they teaching the content? It was all about the content, but there was nothing around, you know, the, the the human experience or the diversity side of a teacher and how they interact with the different students that they do. So I think that's another thing that, again, I left school a while ago. I'm not sure if it's done now, but I think it's something that would be important to implement. So I see three questions in the chat. Um, and I think the earlier one was from Patrick saying, um, how do companies or groups go from lift service to action? Um, so let, let's start there. And I think Natalia, you wanted to speak. So we'll, we'll give you a chance to speak. And then we'll, the most recent question from Deepika will we'll go as well. So how do we move from lip service to action? I'm looking at you, Chris, because you're corporate. <laughs> Damn it. Uh, um, how do you go from lip service to action? I mean, that's the difference between speaking and moving, right? And doing something like moving your legs and walking. Um, I think following through on any promises that are made uh, and, and, and building, doing that consistently, um, I think can help build trust. I'm trying to be as uh, vague and objective as, as possible as while giving this answer. Um, but yeah, I'd say following through on any, any, any verbal agreement that you've made in a timely manner so people aren't sitting behind the scenes thinking this will never happen, right? And then following up consistently, I think. But doing what you said you were going to do, I mean, that would be nice. I was just going to go back go first. To, okay, I'll be quick. Uh, the example or the quote you mentioned earlier, Philip, around the balance sheet, to me, it has to do with that too, right? Is this an element in your balance sheet or is it not? And from there, I mean, it's easy to act on something you decided to do. If you allocated the resources, whatever, there are people that you need to hire, money that you need to to, to disperse from some other place, but is it something that you have put as an important element in your plan and your strategy, I would say is, is the starting point. Because a lot of people will say, yeah, we need to do this and this and this, and then 
nothing happens because you're not actually putting together the resources to make it happen, right? Because it's it's a hypothetical idea that would be great to have, but like Chris said, you're not doing anything to bring it to action. Right, and if you are doing things behind the scenes and nobody knows, like communicate that out. I think that's another thing too. Like there are sometimes pit pieces that are moving and we just aren't aware of it. So like communication is key, you know? We don't know what you're doing unless you tell us otherwise. And the other quick one, sorry, I know you want to say something, Philip, but like have channels for people to say stuff, right? So if you need to have that input for people to, to bring up their needs, know that not everyone's going to feel comfortable coming to talk to you about whatever it is that needs to be fixed, right? So do you have those channels open and available for anybody, anybody, not just even just senior, you know, people, but anybody in the organization or whatever space you're in to, to bring and raise those points is important. Cool. Um, I, I would I would like to add to that um, as well. I lost one of my train of thoughts, but I'll, I'll start where I where I had a thought. This, this is kind of an engineering -y answer, but get good data and do something meaningful with it, right? So I think part of the issue, especially in Canada, I found is we don't have good data <laughs> um, about like who's in the profession, who's getting in, who's getting left out, you know, from like pre-university to university. I mean, I just found out U of T recently just started collecting demographic data on admissions, right? So we don't even know who's applying or where they're coming from. I'm like, how are you going to know you have a problem? And how are you going to know where to go look? Um, they don't want to know they have a problem. Even... That's why they don't collect exactly. the info. Exactly. <laughs> You almost don't want to know you have a problem, right? If you don't test, you won't get positives and your COVID numbers will be low, right? Um, but but that that for me is, is one bit of it, like not just the quantitative data, but also the qualitative data, like find out why it is that the situation is the way that it is, right? If you're having low numbers and you're having it consistently, like you have a problem and you need to dig deeper and understand what what's going on there. And then think about how you are going to address that, right? Um, and commit some resources to actually doing that in a meaningful way. Um, and it's funny because um, this happened in the US, right? The companies have been, there's a report that came out recently, I forget last year what it was, but that just showing that companies have been reporting diversity data for years and nothing's changed. They just say, yeah, this, you know, this is what it is. And they just keep saying it without any like, so what are you gonna do about it, <laughs> right? Um, and no meaningful action. And usually what happens is they're filling out at the bottom, right? So they're hiring more people from diverse backgrounds at the bottom, but not 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 going to the top, right? There's kind of a level beyond which, you know, my brother-in-law calls it the grayscale, right? If you take the if you take the org chart chart of any company, it starts off, you know, white and goes, you know, all the way darker as, as you're going down. And, and that's just how it looks. Right. And it's like, so how do we go from grayscale to something else? Um, I think that that's the question that, um, but I would, you know, one thing would be just gather some good data and information and do something useful with it as well. Right. Um, would be, would be that. Um, I lost the other train of thought, but I want to go to the other question and note that we are at 704, um, which is over time. Some of us are happy to stay, but don't feel obliged to do. If you had other commitments, we're happy for the time that you spent with us, um, if that's all the time you had. Um, but I want to get through some of the questions that were asked um, prior so that we can do that. So Natalia, you if you are still around, you asked to speak, so go ahead and, and speak. Um I'm around, guys. Hi, um, nice to meet you all, and uh, it's it's a, it's a very interesting conversation here. So, I am European. You can now uh, hear my accent, and that is why I wanted to kind of speak to all of you. So, I'm in US since a couple of years. My husband is African American. We met overseas. I've been working overseas for many years in Europe, Asia, US, then back to in Asia and back in US. So, and. Uh, you know, I come from a very, very small country in Europe. Most of you won't even know the name. It's called Moldova. It has 4 million people only. So we've been discriminated a lot during the communist system uh, after 
you know, by more strong European countries. So I know the feeling and what you're going through. And also being married to an African-American, I see my husband struggling and saying many times to me, like, yeah, I haven't been selected because I'm black. Uh, I don't like to call black and white. I don't think, as a European, I don't think there is black and white. I think we just have skin of different color. And I don't think we should keep using and, and, and defining people by color. There is, people are just people. And to be honest, I've worked in Asian countries, I've worked in European countries, and I work in the United States. I love all kinds of people. I think people are beautiful no matter what, what the color of their skin is. I love darker skin, I go tan. I get very white in, in, uh, in winter. I go tan all the time to look darker. I curl my hair to, to, to have the, those curlies. So, but besides that, from my experience, and I have 25 years uh, of experience, I've met wonderful people with, uh, let's say, darker skin in different parts of the world, no matter the color of your skin. I've heard, you know, statements like leave your blackness at the door. Do never think about that. I just want to encourage all of you. You are all great. Leave the fear away. Leave the fear away and just say what you think and do what you want and grow and invest in yourself and don't be scared to say things. And I am from a very small country and a poor family and my dad um, was drinking and I had no help, you know, growing in my life, but I got somewhere, you know, from all my class in the university, I'm the only one who traveled all over the world. I speak six languages and I'm in the United States and I work in a, in a public company. So don't be afraid. I never think that I can't do it. And I am a minority, you know, so just be very courageous. Don't think about you. I think Suzanne color. wanted to say something, actually. I think Suzanne wanted to say something. Suzanne? Yeah, I, I have to leave soon. But the, the small comment I wanted to add, uh, maybe Natalia in response to that, is that there are some experiences that just cannot be translated to other people. I'll give you one very real recent example of something that happened. I was sleeping accidentally, I think on the iPhone, if you press four times, I don't know, remember which buttons, but it calls the police. Uh, and I just remember waking up and pressing in, and I think I was reducing the volume or something. And next thing you know, 911 was being called and I shut it down. Uh, next thing you know, it's knocking on the door. And the fear I had, it's not, I mean, leave it at the door is easy to say, but the fear that I had living in a white neighborhood to open the door in the middle of the night and be the black person that opens the door, it's real fear. It's not something you can, check out, right? And these are things and experiences that just come with us. And as easy as it might be to say, you know, everybody's great and just leave that at the door and, you know, a bunch of other examples. I, I just find that it's important to listen. And sometimes it's difficult to understand what we go through, uh, but just just listen <laughs> would be the, the one thing I would have to say here. Um, not sure if there's any specific questions for me, but I'll, I'll have to drop soon. <laughs> Thanks, Suzanne. Um, the, the point that I wanted to add to that was, um, not sure how to say this, but, but I actually had to learn what it meant to be Black because I grew up in Ghana, everybody looks like me, like thinking about being black in Ghana was was not a thing that I had to do. I had to do it in different ways, but the, the relationship between being black and, and being white in Ghana was more from a colonist and inferiority complex perspective, but it was my country. I didn't have to worry about being discriminated against because of the color of my skin. Um, so when I first arrived in the US, that idea as a lived experience was somewhat foreign to me um and and in many ways still is because i i still haven't had a lot of the extreme lived experiences with racism that other people have had but but i understand it i i i, I see because it's a lived experience right like like suzanne was saying like it, it's not the kind of thing that you can translate from from all your particular um uh, experiences, but I, I've been through a system where I have been judged because of the color of my skin. And actually, the, the, the experience I often have is, is slightly different in that 
I talked about the colonist inferiority complex. I often get the, but you speak English so well for someone coming from Ghana. And I'm like, it's the national language. That's all I know, <laughs> right? It's what we were taught in school, you know, every damn day. Um, why would you assume from the get go that I wouldn't be as articulate as I am or know the things that I do because I lived across the ocean, right? But I've encountered that more times than I would, you know, I would like to, would like to. But, but if you're coming from a particular demographic, that may not be the experience that you have, and so that that experience is is foreign to you. So I think um, it, it's important. Um, the labels are important because that that in a way that that's the label that's been created by the system, and it, so it's it's important to call it out and and identify who it is that the system is attacking and and talking about. Um, because that othering has already happened and the way we're going to dismantle it is to kind of call out who's been othered and who's doing the othering so that we can move from there, right? Um, to then basically say this whole concept doesn't, it doesn't exist anymore is kind of um, brushing over the work that needs to be done in order to get us out of that situation to a place where it actually doesn't matter anymore. Um, but right now it matters. It matters a great deal. Um, I would say, um, for the folks who are coming from that perspective. Chris, I don't know if there's something you wanted to add there as well. Okay. Cool. No, nothing to add. You covered it, as did Suzanne, as did everyone else in the chat. So I'm, I'm good. Cool. Um, I think the question after that, now I have to scroll all the way back up to find it, if someone finds it before me. Um, can't find it. Um, yes, that was Topeka. Um, it says, Chris, this is directed at you. So I guess it says you mentioned you were hiding who you were navigating through corporate world for a while. If someone else is going through that right now at their workplace, any advice you can give for them to truly shine being themselves? Oh, yeah. I shot Deepika a response. I said, short answer, therapy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, that's, that, that is that's like that's such a spiritual journey in your own right like I I had to walk this life and get to a point where I felt comfortable enough in my own skin to be bold enough to be honest about who I am in all regards race religion gender identity whatever that is um, and I think that that's an individual experience um, but I think also being able to build a community of people around you who can support you and encourage you to be who you are, you know, who your authentic self is, I think is helpful too. Cause I couldn't have gotten to this point alone, right? But I've got one or two key people in my life, uh, my personal life that have helped me get to this point. So I think, um, yeah, building a community if you can of folks around you. Great. So I've been signaled that we are over time um, and so we we should try to wrap it up. I think we we're gonna call Topeka's question the last question. I think there were a lot of other questions that were great in the chat. Um, I would suggest Andrea, if you all can capture those questions in the chat, um, that would be useful for maybe some kind of follow up. Um, maybe questions to put out in anonymous fashion out to the community and see what kind of discussion it it generates, but I would say those questions are good questions to capture. Um, so thank you all so much for your time and for your patience and for your perspective and questions. Um, I would like to thank all the panelists, including those who had to leave, Nick, who's a student, who has to go do the student thing, um, and Suzanne, who also had uh, other commitments as well. And Chris, also, thank you so much um, for, for joining us from the US um, to have this conversation that I think is, is really beyond any particular country. Uh, and thank you again to the organizers, Spin Master, Ospi, um, Allison, colleague of mine, and all of you participants for your time. And we hope this, you know, generates action and you know, continual conversation and help us move us forward. <laughs>